So good evening, dear guests, dear colleagues, uh, dear Alaida Asman. Welcome at the continuation of the Kyiv International 68 Now project devoted to cultural and political heritage of the revolt and struggle of 68 in Europe. And uh, let me first of all express my deep thankfulness to Alaida Asman for her presence here. Thank you so much for appreciating our invitation for coming to Kyiv. My name is Vasil Cherepanin. I represent Visual Culture Research Center, the organizer of the 68 Now project. So, having already discussed the French 68, as well as explored the Czech 68 in the context of the Prague Spring within the framework of our project, today we will talk about the German 68, which was marked by the Second World War in a, and its aftermath in the country in dissolution and in particular about the historical contribution of the 68th generation in Germany to what happened not only in the 60s and 70s, but also in the 80s, that has been formative in the emergence of a new Europe. And this link between 68 and 89 is really crucial for us, since what we are trying to develop within the both editions of the Kyiv International, the Kyiv Biennial last year and 68 now project this May, is a specific timeline which runs from the October Revolution in 1917 to the political revolt of 68 to the fall of the Berlin Wall and Velvet Revolutions of 1989 and being projected on the current status quo of an international scale in 2018. We treat these events as a kind of an extended revolution, in which each revolutionary stage supplements the other, and altogether they have been aimed at the whole of Europe. And they still remain unfinished, like Europe itself, and as we know from Habermas, the modernity as well. So revolution, Europe and modernity are deeply intertwined and they urgently need fulfillment and accomplishment, especially today, when they are violently threatened. Tonight, it's my great honor to introduce our notable speaker, Alaida Asman, a German historian and cultural anthropologist. In the period of 1993-2014, Alaida Asman held the chair of English Literature and Literary Theory at the University of Constance in Germany. Alaida Asman also had visiting professorships at Princeton University, at Rice University in Houston, Yale University, University of Chicago, as well as at the University of Vienna. Asman's early works were about English literature and the history of literary communication. Since the 90s, her focus has been on cultural anthropology, especially cultural and communicative memory, the terms that she and her husband Jan Asman coined and developed. Her specific interests cluster around the history of German memory since 1945, the role of generations in literature and society, and theories of memory. Since 2011, Alaida Asman has been working on a research project called The Past in the Present, Dimensions and Dynamics of Cultural Memory, that summarizes her and Jan Asman's work on memory. In 2017, together with Jan Asman, she was awarded the Bolton Prize for Collective Memory. Her recent publications in English include Cultural Memory and Western Civilizations, Functions, Media Archives, and Shadows of Trauma, Memory and the Politics of Post-War Identity. In that regard, I would also like to draw your attention to the Guidebook of the Kyiv International, which was recently published by Visual Culture Research Center and Medusa Books, to which Alaida Asman has kindly contributed her text entitled The Crisis of the Future and the Reinvention of the Past. You can have a look at this publication in the corridor to, at the entrance to this hall and today you can buy it with a special discount. But also there you can find another classical book of Alaida Asman entitled Ukrainian translation of this book basically Memory Spaces, Forms and Transformations of Cultural Memory. I would also like to thank to our institutional partners and foundations, Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, Goethe Institute Ukraine and Prince Klaus Fund, whose kind support made this project possible. And also, 68 Now project will be continued in Germany in the following months, 
in collaboration with Viadrina European University, exploring the impact 68 has had on the educational system. So, Alida Asman, 68 generation in Germany, you are very warmly welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, dear Vasil, for this kind introduction and also for um, <coughs> getting me to come to Kiev by writing enticing emails, which I could not resist. And I really did not regret coming here because from the very first uh, moment when I arrived, you trans were transformed into such a fantastic tour guide and we toured the city and so many places and I learned immensely. I would also like uh, to greet a couple of people in this audience um, I had never imagined would come together today. Um, uh, to start um, out with, it is Ala, my translator into Ukrainian uh, of the book Erinnerungsräume, uh, Memory Spaces, whom I just had the pleasure to meet and also a publisher. Then there are two colleagues from Lviv University, from the German department, whom I um, met already earlier in a, to, in a visit uh, to Ukraine in Chernovitz. And there's also a sizable part of my own family here uh, who did not travel to Kiev to listen to this lecture, but to come, of course, to the championship. And they are eagerly awaiting the weekend. So um, welcome to you all. I'm happy that we are united here. So let me start my lecture with a question, what are generations? The discourse about generations was started and shaped by sociologist Karl Mannheim with an influential essay in 1928. <clears throat> Some of the questions that he asked were, what transforms age cohorts into generations? What binds them together? How do they distinguish themselves from one another, <clears throat> from other generations? <clears throat> Some generations are respect retrospective constructs by historians who are interested in the collective experience and use them for pe uh, purposes of period periodization. The term baby boomer, for instance, is an American label for a demographically strong cohort born in the 1940s and 50s, during and after the Second World War. <clears throat> it is clearly a descriptive label for a generation that does not capture a collective self-image, <clears throat> let alone a publicly visible movement. So you would not say, I am a baby boomer. You know. In this way, the term differs strikingly from the label 1968, which refers in Europe to roughly the same age group, but conveys much more the meaning of a collective historical experience and a commitment. There are also generations that are distinguished by numbers. They are counted according to an in, uh, incisive event, <coughs> a point of origin that refers <coughs> um, to an event that is chosen as a start from a new history. And these events uh, could be wars, it could be genocides, but within the family framework of an individual family, there are often also acts of immigration from which you count the first, the second, or the third generation. <clears throat> Generations are certainly never homogeneous and differ <clears throat> from intellectual trends, from artistic movement and political parties. A generation is formed by a smaller or greater number of individuals who create a style and an image <coughs> for the group whom they aim to represent, but there is also always a great number that remains detached, indifferent or inconspicuous. Generational affiliation is not a matter of choice. No one <coughs> can choose it, it, nor can it be changed. It remains with us throughout our lifespan. Karl Mannheim studied generations within the frame of modernization. Modernization <coughs> theory is interested in the question, what drives history? 
What promotes change, innovation and progress? His answer was generations. According to Mannheim, generations accelerate history by initiating developments and pushing the society in new directions. He considered generations as important agents of change because they share a historical moment and represent a youth that is much more open, flexible, curious, and impressionable than any other age group in the society. For this reason, the study of generations is usually con <coughs> confined to a short temporal window of opportunity that is closed when this cohort enters middle age and disappears into the boring mainstream of society. I want to add <coughs> three points to this general discourse of, on generations that, <coughs> I will <coughs> that will enter into my discussion on the impact of the 68th generation. So my first point is that generations are in no way homogeneous <coughs> because they are shaped by historical, national, political, cultural and local circumstances. My second point is that a generation is not only shaped by circumstances that define its specific range of possibilities and options, it also shapes itself by being exposed to and opening themselves up to pressing <coughs> problems, moral issues and crises for which they have to find new answers. This answer can become what I want to call a generational historical project. My third point is that a generation is defined not only by its youth, but also by its whole lifespan, including maturity, middle age and age. This means that generations cannot fully be captured by a single year or event. <clears throat> I want to argue that in Germany, the 68th generation peaked not only in the late 60s, when this age cohort was in its 20s, but also, and this has not yet received due attention, in the 1980s, <clears throat> when they were in their 40s. Each phase, as I want to argue, was defined by a different generational project. But they clearly complement each other and are connected within the individual biographies of this particular generation. It is a paradoxical law that anniversaries and commemoration dates that the <coughs> um, of these uh, <coughs> dates that the growing historical distance brings us closer to events of the past. This calendar is organized by numbers. The most meaningful and efficient number to agitate our historical sense is the zero. <clears throat> For instance, 1914-2014, after 100 years, the Great War, that had been almost completely forgotten in countries like Germany, Austria or Russia returned with full force. Historical anniversaries cut out a piece of the past to bring it back into the present. In order to stage, to reinspect, to discuss and to reassess it. They open a clearly defined window of opportunity for historical reflection. This magic is exhausted as soon as the specific combination of numbers is changed. Commemorative practices are important for the self-understanding and self-image of a society. In the medium of such reinspections, a society confirms central <coughs> turning points of its history and critically probes the impact of significant events. Anniversaries also underline the fact that there is no closure to the evaluation of history as each, each present enters into a new encounter with its past. This is also true for the anniversaries of the 68th generation in Germany. After 40 years, 10 years ago in 2008, the assessment of the impact of the 68th generation was still rather self-critical. In retrospect, some of the former <coughs> protagonists 
distanced themselves from the authoritarian gesture of their youth revolt. Ten years later now, in 2018, the evaluation proves to be much more positive and full of nostalgia. Fifty years after the seminal events in Berlin, Paris and Woodstock, we can register a transnational canonization of this <coughs> generation, which seems to represent everything that today we are so sadly lacking. A vision of the future, a mobilizing grassroots movement, a liberation from apathy and repressive traditions, a renewal of the critical spirit. After the financial crisis, the Syrian war, and the experience of mass migration, the consensus about European values is at stake. In this situation, the 68th revolt speaks to us <clears throat> in a new way. It is charged with new meaning as a usable past for the EU. Under the recent pressure of a dissolution of a democratic consensus, the legacy of the 68th generation is becoming more and more important. It is now generally agreed that after the founding of the German state in 40, 1948, it was this generation that has laid the foundation to a modern democratic society <coughs> in Germany. The year 1968 <coughs> has indeed become a symbol, if not a myth. Like all symbols, it is saturated with emotions, concepts, memories, and associations, but it is not very precise. In Germany, the defining moment of the, for the formation of this generation happened already in 1967. In Berlin, on June 2nd, when the student Benno Ohnesorg was murdered by a policeman, during the demonstrations against the presence of the Iranian Shah. Rudi Dutschke, the charismatic leader of this generation, was hit by bullets in Berlin already in the beginning of the year 68, namely on April 11th. Two other European events followed shortly. The first were the international students' demonstrations one month later in Paris, which clearly marked the peak of the left European students' revolt. And four months later, the Czechoslovakian student demonstrations in Prague, ending with the death of, for instance, Jan Palach and other students. While the May event in Paris, <coughs> students protested against structures of inequality in a democratic state, in August 68, the students were part of the movement of the Prague Spring protesting against an illiberal communist regime and occupation. The May events in pra Paris and the August events in Prague both happened in 1968, but are very difficult to subsume under one label. They clearly reflect the divide between West and East during the Cold War. But from a more general point of view, they converged as democratic ideas of the West had gone East, so to speak, and communist ideas of the East had gone West. There is so much that we admire and ascribe today to the 68th generation. They have transformed our lifestyle, they have democratized the society, they have reformed the institutions, they have broken with the Nazi past. This is quite a workload for young people aged between 18 and 28. After 50 years, we are no longer dealing with the history of the generation, but with the myth that has been created around it. 1968 has become a universal symbol that is invoked to talk about our present situation. It synthesizes many revolts, political movements, and social changes in the late 60s. In, most, <clears throat> in its most gen uh, general sense, 1968 today stands for a shift in the Cold War era from a traditional to a modern society.
emphasizing the liberation from repressive bourgeois traditions, fighting for political equality, celebrating pop culture, including beat and jazz, hippie and flower power movements, a new concept of the gendered body and drugs, gender emancipation, post-colonial politics, peace movements, and ecological awareness. All of this is framed, <clears throat> all of this was framed by new mass media, such as records, radio, films, and color television programs for the first time in 67. Before the 68th generation decided to liberate itself and the world, <clears throat> it had already been liberated to a large extent. As it grew more ideological and political, however, the concept of liberation changed from forms of peaceful protest of civil rights movement in the USA to more militant interventions that required a new language and ideology and did not exclude the option of violence. The motto of youth protest clearly changed during the 1960s. It started with we shall overcome, and it ended with proletarians of all countries unite to fight against global capitalism. This turn from civil aims and liberal values towards a more radical left political program went hand in hand with sympathies uh, for autocratic regimes and blind spot for dictatorial practices. The GDR did not have space for the 68th, uh, for a 68th movement for two reasons. First, because it would not tolerate manifestations of youth protest. And second, in the, in the GDR there was nothing to protest about because the aims of the youth protest had already been fulfilled by the government itself. By the way, there's an interesting film right now in the cinemas it's called Das Schweigende Klassenzimmer, the uh, classroom that kept silent. And it is uh, interesting that this is a um, group of students in a classroom in the GDR um, and uh, protesting against the <coughs> invasion of or uh, oppression in, in Hungary in '56, And they're doing it uh, by a collective act of silence. So silence became their mode of prote protest, whereas in the <coughs> West, um, the German 68th generation uh, did exactly the opposite. They broke the silence. <coughs> this at least was the ideal of those radical leftists <coughs> um, of West Germany who had their loyalties in East Germany and were supported by its state. For the same reason, they had little sympathies for the democratic development of the Prague Spring. The invasion of the Soviet tanks in the city, crushing the movement of their fellow students on, in August 68, did not make a deep impression on West German students. This event did not fit into the script that they had internalized locating the source of all evil in Western capitalism and the source of all good in Eastern communism. From, for a fighting generation, there was little room for ambivalence, puzzlement, empathy, and dismay. When we talk about 1968, we should not <coughs> only talk about universal symbol, symbols, but also about the specific historic and political contexts of different 68 generations. I will focus here on the German situation and start with a longer historical perspective. This 68 generation did not pop up out of the blue, but had a longer historical legacy. In a historical perspective, German culture is part of the framework of Western modernization that is based on change, innovation and progress. In this context, Youth pro protest has been acknowledged as an important factor of innovation. As modernization was linked to the continuous breaking of traditions, the young were expected to fulfill exactly this task. Historians tell us that this cultural script was first installed in Germany in the period of enlightenment at the end of the 18th century. <coughs> 
which is defined as the beginning of the modern era. The first historical youth protest was embodied by the generation of Sturm und Drang, or Storm and Pressure, in the 1770s. Involved, and it involved <coughs> many canonized authors, uh, such as Goethe and Schiller. Storm and pressure as an expression of youth revolt became cultural norms that were written into the script of each new generation. There were authoritarian periods, of course, in German history, like the Second Empire, in which this cultural program was played down and bracketed, and others, like the Third Reich, in which it was blatantly abused. But after the Second World War, after the total victory over Nazi Germany, the demise of its ideology and the rebuilding of a democratic state with the help of the Allies, there was a period in which the modernist cultural program of revolt met in West Germany with unique historical conditions and gained explosive traction. The transition of the political framework of a state from dictatorship to democracy can be achieved in a short period of time, <clears throat> the political framework, but it takes decades and generations to transform a whole society. The first generation to appear on the stage of history after 1945 <clears throat> in Germany was not the 68th generation, but the 45ers, that of the 45ers. It is therefore important to briefly look at the, this first, first youth generation after 45 to better understand the specific position of the 68th generation. The 45ers, as they are called, were born between 1926 and 28 or 9 and had been heavily indoctrinated by the Nazi state from early on. At the age of 15, they were taken out of school and sent directly into the war, the, into the last years of the war, to operate the air defense batteries. If they survived war and imprisonment, <clears throat> they returned to school to finish their interrupted education. After school, they were the first generation to, to start their professional training and university education in a democratic country, but given the teachers around them, most of which were former Nazis, not in a democratic environment. Modernization, in the sense of breaking with traditions, was much easier for this youth generation than for their fathers and mothers, who had been heavily involved in the Nazi state. While after 45, the older generation considered themselves first and foremost as defeated and humiliated, for the 45ers, the term liberation had quite another ring. It meant liberated to a new chance and to a new life. It therefore became the generational project of this first post-war youth generation to embrace the standards of re-education that were haughtily rejected by their elders and to invest themselves wholeheartedly into the process of democratization. I want to argue that it was this first youth generation that proved to be the effective medium to accept liberation and democracy as a gift from the Allies and to put it into practice in German post-war society. This generation eagerly embraced the new future, but as they also shared the negative legacy of the Nazi past, they turned their backs towards the past and their <coughs> former lives supporting the general pact of silence that pervaded the cultural climate of post-war Germany during the first four decades. I have introduced the 45 generation for two reasons. The first is that the democratization of German society was not the project of the 68th generation. This was the project of the previous generation who embraced this task with a full knowledge and experience of what it means to have lived in a dictatorship. The 68th generation differed from the 45ers in that it was not actively involved in the war and therefore did not feel complicit with their fathers and uncles. On the contrary, it became the 68th 
generational project to break the pact of silence. They stood for a fresh start and turned the whole force of their protest against the older generation, creating a clash between old and young or guilty and innocent. In confronting their parents at home, they made their private revolt public and their public revolt private. Turning against their home and origin, they had the courage to ask uncomfortable questions and to initiate radical change. Their courage was underpinned by rage, which is an explosive mixture that can become the fuel for a revolt, if not for revolution. In Germany, the protesting students broke the repressive silence, turning against their parents, their teachers, their society, their state. Here is an anecdote that shows how, for this generation, referencing the Nazi past became a tool in a political struggle. At the University of Bonn, a couple of students of the militant student organization SDS had a date with the rector of this university. When they arrived, the rector was still absent. <clears throat> the secretary led the group into his office where the students who <clears throat> sat in the easy chairs started to smoke the rector's cigars and leafed through the <laughs> official guest book of the university. In this book, they found immediately an entry by President Heinrich Lübcke uh, in office from 59 to 69. Under the signature of the president, they inserted Builder of Concentration Camp. As a consequence of this episode, the rector decided to exmatriculate the students from the university. Some of these students were historians, however. They checked the name of the university lawyer that had signed the document and went to an um, historical archive where they found the NS file of which they sent a copy <coughs> to the rector. The next step of the story were the readmission of the students at the university and the dismissal of the lawyer from the university. <coughs> so, breaking the silence and exposing the Nazi past in Germany <coughs> was one thing. Working through the past, however, and acknowledging the victims of the genocide was another thing. This latter aspect was not in the focus of the protesting youth of 68. The heroes of this generation were Marx and Lenin, Che Guevara and Ho Chi Minh. It was not Fritz Bauer, Attorney General and Prosecutor, who organized the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt from 1963 to 65. At that time, Bauer worked very much in isolation and suffered from the repressive climate of silencing uh, the Nazi past, while the young generation pursued other projects such as mobilizing for a global battle against imperialism and fascism. The interest in the past came 20 years later, when the 68th generation were moving into jobs and raising families. Taking over responsibility in the society changed their attitude. It was in this context that this generation found a new project which consisted not only in breaking the silence by condemning their parents, but in opening up new approaches to the Nazi past. We may characterize this approach with terms of sociologist Rainer Lepsius, who made a distinction between the terms externalizing and internalizing. <clears throat> the pact of silence had been sustained by externalizing <clears throat> the guilt, which means that the blame <clears throat> um, for the monstrous crimes was always attributed to others, a small criminal group or Hitler himself. Internalizing, on the other hand, meant that the second generation was taking over the responsibility for the Nazi crimes that the older generation had averted. The sons and daughters accepted and embraced, embraced what their parents had dismissed and negated. In doing so, they became the founders of what is today called German memory culture. It consists in breaking the silence by asking 
very concrete questions such as, for instance, which Jewish families were deported from this particular city, which Jewish professors, salesmen, artists were kicked out of universities, firms, shops, theaters, where did they die, <coughs> did any of them survive, do they have children or relatives that can be invited to the city in which their grandfathers and grandmothers once lived and suffered. Working through the past turned out to be a lifelong process that continues until this day with questions such as who took over the buildings, apartments and possessions of these former owners. After having broken the silence, it became the project of this generation to recover this history from forgetting by exposing the crimes, by marking historic, um, as historical sites, the murderous network of the perpetrators of <coughs> concentration camps all over Germany, also not only Eastern, Germany, uh, Eastern Europe, and by recovering as far as possible the traces, the names, and the stories of the victims. The 68th generation was by no means homogeneous. It continued after 68 in different directions. Some became radicalized and turned criminal. Others made a career and became politicians. But their impact did not end with a protest movement of their youth, but found a new focus in a second project. 20 and 30 years later, the members of this generation built up a self critical memory culture that was historically new because it did not extol the his heroic deeds of the nation but exposed its most horrendous crimes. Crimes of the Wehrmacht was the title of an exhibition on the war of annihilation and the Holocaust that toured in many German cities between 19. 95 and 2003. It was designed by Hannes Heer, the same student who told me the anecdote about the student's visit in the rector's office in Bonn. In this exhibition, a section was dedicated to the massacre of Babi Yar, where on the 29th and 30th <coughs> September 1941, 10 days after the arrival of uh, German Wehrmacht in Kiev, Special Nazi units murdered the entire Jewish population of Kiev, namely 33,771 men, women and children who were unable to flee. It was the first time that this crime was presented in public in many German cities and, formed the <coughs> and forms of collaboration between SS units and the German army were discussed in the families and the streets and in the media. The exhibition had a strong emotional impact and a symbolic meaning. It was a clear step towards internalizing <coughs> these crimes and taking responsibility for them as part of German history. In another form, writer Katja Petrovskaya, born 1970 uh, in Kiev, has recently brought this event back to Germany. By using the German language for her family memoir, which she published in 2014, she translated her fragile web of memorial links and traces from a Ukrainian and Russian audience to a German readership. In the center of her book, she imagines her father's babushka, her great-grandmother, perhaps called Esther, Describing in slow motion, because, <coughs> because uh, perhaps Esther is no longer able to move and to escape, how she falls prey to German murderers and lies buried together with other family members in the mass grave of Babi Yar. <coughs> there they were shot, she writes, and from her new position, which is now in Berlin, Petrovskaya suddenly and unexpectedly addresses her German readers. With the following words, she brings the event into the present and back to the German reader's historical consciousness by writing, <clears throat> but I'm sure you know this, Kiev is just as far from Berlin as Paris. So 
What is the legacy of 1986? We certainly want to continue the critical spirit of 68 <coughs> that has not disappeared because it is irreversible. We also want to continue the commitment of this generation, their sense of urgency and dedication. But we cannot learn from the past if we idol, only idolize it. There are three points here that I want to conclude with. First, the critical spirit has to include self-criticism. This can start with reassessing the leading concept of uh, 68, which is liberation. This is certainly <coughs> what this generation stood for, liberation from social repression, paralyzing traditions and outdated gender roles and lifestyles. It connected, <coughs> it connected to an authoritarian, um, if connected to an authoritarian ideology, however, liberation itself can run the danger of becoming itself violent and illiberal. In other words, we can no longer admire and continue the anti-democratic effects. It is important to see that the new right <coughs> is now doing exactly that. that. In Prague, for instance, former dissidents who had opposed the Soviet violence are now turning against Europe to protect their nation against external influences. Second point, the spirit of 86 was transnational. It linked many cities and connected the dissident, dissident youth on both sides of the Atlantic in their imagining and fighting for a more equal society. <coughs> This movement, however, happened under the constraints of the Cold War and was deformed by it. By pitting capitalism against communism, it deepened the divide between East and West. <coughs> the EU today is the result of two collapses, German fascism in 45 and the Soviet Union in 89. <coughs> when constructing a genealogy of this new Europe, we need to bridge the divide of the Cold War and move forward to further movements and moments of liberation in a democratic spirit. This legacy of the EU includes the Prague Spring of 1968, the Solidarność workers in Poland in 1980, the peaceful revolution in East German cities in 1989, and the Euromaidan protests in Kiev in 2014. As we admire today, this is my third point, the spirit and mobilizing power of a generation that changed the world in the late 60s, we may ask, what is the mobilizing power of the EU today that can speak to a whole society in a time of new wars, re-erected frontiers and growing nationalism? In her already mentioned memoir, perhaps Esther Katya Petrovskaya, born in Kiev, also writes about the world into which she was born. She writes, no visible markers of minorities or traits of a close community were allowed in the Soviet Union. For the international internationalists, she writes, all doors were open, one great family and one great language. She also hints at the exclusionary spirit of this union. After the war, she writes, the Jews were again in danger. They were stigmatized as homeless cosmopolitans and not admitted to the great family of nations in the Soviet Brotherhood. The leading symbol of this union was a firm handshake. The EU is a different kind of union, acknowledging difference and encouraging diversity. It is symbolized not by a handshake, but by a circle of stars, each of which is a unit in itself, existing in equal distance from a common center. The problem about this symbol, however, is <coughs> that the center is a void. If the center is left empty, the cohesion of the EU is at stake. What is, what is it exactly, we may ask, what is it exactly that keeps these stars from derailing from their course and falling apart? <coughs> 
<clears throat> As an English literature scholar, I'm tempted to quote here a poem by William Butler Yeats, who wrote, Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. But it is not anarchy that is loosed upon the world, but a firm determination to turn back the clock and to build new old autocratic ethnic nation states. The future of the EU will depend on what we place into the empty center. This is the project, I would argue, of the Kiev International, of which we are all part here. I quote from the flyer. The idea of cross-border unity and international solidarity is of utmost urgency for the future survival of Europe. It also mentions, I quote again, democratic internationalism and the principle of inclusivity. Here is my version or vision of European values that I would like to place in the empty center. I, I call it the European dream in allusion to and in distinction from the American dream. While the American dream is oriented exclusively towards the future and addresses the individual, promising him or her material wealth and success in exchange for talent, discipline and hard work, the European dream is oriented to the past and the future addressing whole nations that had been entangled in the history of extreme violence and have overcome this history by drawing lessons from it. What I offer in concluding now is to write into the blank, blank <laughs> center uh, of our logo of the EU four lessons that Europe has learned from its history. These lessons are not a straight narrative, but they could form a shared heritage. <coughs> and here I use the motto of the 2018 EU commemoration year, which is shared heritage. They can help perhaps to define a consensus of values that can serve as a point of convergence and a common denominator for its member states, and also help to define breaches and aberrations from these norms. And here are the four points or lessons, two after 45. They were the lesson of peace, namely the transformation of deadly enemies into friendly and collaborating neighbors. Second, the lesson of justice and freedom, namely the transformation of dis dictatorships into reliable democracies. And again, two more after 1989. Number three was the, the lesson of historical truth, which was a new self-critical memory culture that challenges monologic national myths. And number four, the lesson of a moral standard. And here I mean the implementation of human rights, of a human rights regime supported by a civil society. 2015 saw the peak of mass migration and the arrival of refugees at European borders fleeing from war and terror. In order to respond to this challenge, the EU needs no additional lessons. It needs to heed the lessons already learned and to put them to use. This is the moment of probing and testing these lessons and of living up to its standards. But to do this, we must first know them. Without a sense of Europe's history and legacy, it is impossible to envision its future. I trust that a critical revision of 1968 is an important step in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your beautiful presentation and uh, now we will uh, have a Q&A session so please raise, you, raise your hands and my colleague will assist you with the microphone. <coughs>
But also, I would like, before starting that, I would like to thank to our translator, Katarina Popravka, for her beautiful job. Thank you so much. <laughs> and just probably to start the discussion before uh, the audience is thinking about the questions, uh, I, would, uh, I would depart from the point you just uh, ended up with. Uh, these four lessons uh, and the, uh, the, their connections to to the memory issues, to the politics of memory, as we, call, as we call it here as well. And my question, as we discussed a lot about the uh, so-called decommunization laws, which is basically Ukraine is having this process um, in the context of the Eastern Europe, because it's this kind of Eastern European specificity, what uh, after the uh, end of GDR was called the uh, DDR had nie gegeben. GDR has never existed, this famous logo, uh, graffiti, sorry, which was put on the uh, ruins of the Palace of Republic uh, on Alexanderplatz in Berlin. So here, because of the warfare, it's, uh, it has uh, much more violent uh, repercussions. And um, so how would you suggest from the point of view of theories of memory and, and also practicing uh, different kinds of uh, commemorative uh, practices, uh, is it possible, uh, especially in the context when the revolution uh, has been substituted with a warfare also coming from the outside and being supplemented on the local level with the different kinds of uh, counter-revolutionary strategies and tendencies here? Uh, and uh, what, what are the recipes or what are the um, pro methods how to work with memory under such conditions when even the immediate memory I uh, mean, uh, that one of the revolutionary times several years ago is being hijacked by na far-right nationalism and also speculated uh, by the state. So what is to be done? Uh, should we wait for some time when, the, when, we, when we, we will have this uh, lesson of peace? Or it's already possible, as you also uh, depicted the, the uh, uh, impact of the six-day German generation in producing new type of self-critical memory politics, right? And uh, so, I is it possible somehow under the times of the warfare to, uh, to propose some alternative narrative uh, in, in this particular context? How would you s uh, depict the situation? Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, these are many, many questions yes. uh, at once. <laughs> um, perhaps I can um, address two points here. <clears throat> First of all, I should make more explicit what I meant by lesson of historical truth here. Um, and why after 89, of course, historians have been there all along, they have made their <laughs> job and they have worked and they have published endlessly and agreed and disagreed, uh, so there's a lot that historians know, but that, is, that does not feed into the society and into the consciousness of the citizens. Um, it's, it's a totally different thing <clears throat> to talk about what uh, is transmitted into the society and what is known by historians, which is usually um, in it. Uh, quite apart uh, from public media and public discourse. And my point was here that <clears throat> uh, after 89, there was um, something that is really important in the long run, and that was an opening of Eastern European archives. So historians uh, could no longer, <clears throat> of course historians are always dependent on archives, and in this case, um, they can now could do uh, more research on the topic of the Second World War. And um, they, what the effect was that they had to change the <coughs> popular narratives of uh, European nations. And I will give you just a few examples. Um, uh, France, for instance, uh, had uh, placed its self, collected self-image, its, its national narrative on, on a resistor narrative. They had been totally, you know, resisting, like Charles, Charles de Gaulle had also propagated this uh, <coughs> narrative of resistance. And after the opening of the archives and Henri Rousseau, uh, the historian, French historian, had written his book about Vichy, it was no longer to, uh, possible to adhere to this story. It had to become more complex. So the, uh, the process that happened then was um, that national narratives were becoming more inclusive and more self-critical. By including uh, the, the, the part of the story that uh, had been ignored because it collided with the self-pride and the positive self-image of the collective. 
it is very difficult to introduce uh, shameful incidents uh, into your national uh, <coughs> narrative. Usually uh, you find all kinds of means to keep this out yeah. and this is why I introduced the term externalization. Mm -hmm. But now internalization had to happen and because there was historical evidence and it could no longer be kept uh, you know, uh, under cover of, of uh, institutions uh, that are far removed from the society. <coughs> so this had an effect and I can even go to Switzerland and uh, they had a um, truth co um, historical commission and it turned out that even a neutral country like Switzerland had new memory uh, sites such as the banks and the gold uh, stolen you know and, and um, located there <coughs> from the victims and also the frontiers the borders which uh, were also connected with all kinds of stories that had been suppressed so I'm, I'm just um, trying to make clear what I mean by uh, historical um, truth, that <coughs> the findings of historical truth, if they um, support this uh, account of victims, uh, can no longer be played down or excluded uh, from a, a narrative, and uh, that has uh, really in a way changed uh, quite a number of uh, national narratives. I'm, I'm not arguing that it has uh, it succeeded in all countries. Poland right now, Poland right now, as we know, has just uh, uh, now executed a new law uh, which forbids to thematize. <laughs> it is yeah. so explicit what is now forbidden. Explicitly forbids to thematize poles uh, who are not shown in the position of heroes or victims. So, so the uh, resistors, um, uh, heroes, um, and uh, victims. And uh, so this whole uh, issue of collaboration is banned uh, public, uh, publicly and um, by law. <coughs> and if you write anything about it, like uh, Jean uh, um, yeah, Jean Gross yeah. did, you know, of course you, you would be in prison immediately. So this is um, just showing that this is really an issue, and uh, it's not n uh, necessary that uh, countries follow it. C yeah. Countries can also oppose it. But the big, big difference is now that we all know that they oppose it, and the more they mm. talk about banning all of this knowledge, is they are making it more and more public. Uh, uh, we have heard so much about, you know, collaboration in Poland since this law was uh, really um, issued. Um, mm. So this was the, the first part of the question: how I um, <coughs> introduced this. Uh, concept uh, which was much much too short as a really an abbreviation in my lecture but now what you're saying is is really very um, important and uh, perhaps I can only take uh, your example of the GDR uh, as the German parallel or example indeed after the reunification in Germany um, we uh, could all witness that the history of the GDR was uh, vanishing uh, at a very fast space. And <coughs> uh, the most um, conspicuous symbol was the central um, <coughs> Palace de la République, yeah. Palace of the Republic, <coughs> which um, had to disappear in order to make a um, uh, place for the building that it had actually um, ousted, which was the castle, Prussian, Prussian castle. Um, bombed in 1950 only, so after after the war. <coughs> um, the de departure of this ca building was not a speedy affair. You could tear down buildings <coughs> easily, but not uh, buildings built in the uh, 60s because they are full of asbestos. They are much too poisonous. So the building, uh, the montage of this building had to go very slowly. So the Berlin people had, uh, I think, a year uh, span uh, 10 months or 12 months uh, to say goodbye to this building because it was very slowly vanishing. But <coughs> after it vanished, um, many, especially those people who had their youth in the GDR and very important um, periods of their biography, uh, for them, it, uh, the <coughs> extinguishing, uh, erasing of this past was like erasing their biographies. No. Suddenly, they had no more um, mm. context for their lives. They felt um, uh, really in, uh, deeply hurt and um, deprived uh, of their identity. 
Um, so this was something that was not at all really um, anticipated uh, in these processes. I think uh, if we had a second chance, we would make it very differently now. But uh, the second chance is, is maybe <laughs> now in, in your country. And uh, the question is, I'm talking about lessons from history. Can we learn from the history <laughs> lessons of another nation? But in, in this case, <clears throat> I'm, uh, again, we are again confronted with a very radical shift. And of course, the shift from dictatorship to democracy that you uh, right, is, is um, so radical that, uh, well, in the first case, after 45, of course, all uh, symbols relating to the Nazi period were banned immediately. Um, uh, and nobody complained about that. Um, uh, on the contrary, there, uh, it would, good care was taken that they would not uh, persevere so that they would not become uh, the focus of a new cult, you know, of these mm -hmm. things. So uh, that was the idea. You have to purge uh, this um, uh, radically. Of course, materially, you cannot do this at all because people want to mm, create this cult. They find other means to do it. You will never get them all, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> regulated in, in this particular way. But when it comes now to uh, erasing, like toppling monuments and um, erasing um, uh, buildings, what you also erase is at the same time history. And as I already said, people who lived in this uh, time, for them, that history is part of their identity and their biography. And one uh, can loses one's sense of the future and direction if all of this is automatically uh, gone. And, uh, of course, there's also so much that is perhaps to be revered and to be acknowledged and to be praised and uh, also to be learned about it. I mean, if we erase it and we do not even have a chance to learn about it, we also deprive ourselves of the history. So I think um, uh, history in the, in the context of um, Western democratic uh, cultures has been a very huge asset and very um, a treasure because we, um, we do not only have political archives, uh, we also have historical archives. Historical archives are the archives and the, um, the memory of the history that we use even though these things are no longer functioning or are no longer directly um, <coughs> feed, add, fed into our um, daily um, work and action. So um, the wealth of history, to learn about uh, history and one's own history and see uh, the traits and to learn that this is no longer the case, but it is, we can still tell the story, uh, is, is valuable. And of course, you can frame it in such a way <coughs> that you uh, <coughs> make it, uh, that you translate it to the people in the present and they understand the difference between the past and the mm -hmm. present by learning about it. So all of this, uh, I would argue, is a cultural uh, part of cultural memory because um, these uh, memories are always layered and if you um, destroy too many layers uh, you have very little to base uh, your um, <coughs> country's identity on. So uh, these were uh, two no. attempts to respond to this difficult question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, please, uh, if you have any question, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like <coughs> to ask you about this memory culture and the lesson of freedom. So you've told us that mm, that the Germans had the, their lesson of freedom then and that they accepted their guilt, so externalization. And then I would like to know whether they managed to not to become the alert target for the manipulations because of their guilt. So. Okay, the second, we're now talking about number two, the second lesson of freedom. Let me explain quickly what I meant by that. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain what was too much uh, condensed here. Um, I'm talking really about the fact that many, many uh, European nations now in the EU um, uh, used to be or had periods of dictatorships as they experience in history. So uh, it went as late as the 1970s. Actually, we have three dictatorships in the West, Southwest, namely, namely uh, Portugal, uh, Spain, and uh, Greece. You know. These countries very <coughs> recently only uh, turned away from dictatorship. And um, 
I once talked to a <coughs> colleague in, in um, UK, in England, and she said, well, uh, one of the reasons why England does not fit into the European Union is we never had a dictatorship. So England, of course, would be a clear ex uh, exception of this, of this case. And they, they are very proud uh, to have never succumbed to this, uh, one of any evils of dictatorships, but that they did the Magna Carta uh, already in the 12th century, and they have you know, uh, uh, only democratic traditions. Um, now, <coughs> they are alone with this prize in a way, and they need allies, but they may uh, reconsider uh, this um, <coughs> in a different way. But the point is really that this transformation from this experience into a democracy is, is, uh, <coughs> is a guiding um, principle or a mark that characterizes uh, many, many European nations. And uh, therefore, <coughs> it is the, the sense that uh, they have gone through something, uh, and Germany has gone through it twice in two very different forms, um, and therefore it is so valuable to have overcome this evil. And, and the sense of uh, having overcome this evil, um, of course, is that way of a compass for the future. We don't want to fall back into it. And we, we don't accept any, uh, you know, even lapses in this direction of becoming authoritarian or illiberal democracies. All these new terms that we now have, undemocratic democracies, whatever you might call them. So I think uh, Germans have become very, very vary about uh, these concepts uh, because of this historical legacy. Um, and I think that uh, that is a shared uh, experience that really uh, creates this uh, sense of uh, lesson of freedom and uh, also valuing and protecting uh, this gift of freedom. Okay, have I made myself clear? Uh, thanks, for, thank you very much for your presentation. But I want to ask questions in Ukraine, as you may. Mm -hmm. uh, you see a lot of sympathy to your work, to what you do. And I have a few questions, more than three. I'm sorry, but at least two. Three. No, very short, two. We don't have time. Okay, okay. Тоді перше питання. Як ви вважаєте, на виставі це є мода, чи це є напрям науковий, який має перспективу? Друге питання, коли ми говоримо про покоління і говоримо про символ 68-го року, то у нас є рефлексії з приводу з приводу поняття пам'ять другого і пам'ять третього покоління і відповідно позиція Маріани Хірш із постпам'яттю. Чи розподіляєте ви думку про те, що постпам'ять, позиція Маріани Хірш, це є продовження, те, що є після пам'яті, чи все-таки ми можемо говорити про пам'ять другого і пам'ять третього покоління окремо, а постпам'ять розглядати як категорію окремо? Дякую. Дякую дуже за цю питання. Я не можу відповідати першу частину. Це мемори студії, фешн, чи це форма школи? I tried to do my best, <laughs> that's all. And now the second part I, I found really interesting, um, post-memory. It is uh, definitely linked to the issue of generations. And um, post-memory is a term coined by a second generation person, namely Marianne Hirsch, um, <coughs> whose parents um, uh, lived in Czarnowitz and she was born um, in Romania. Um, and then emigrated to the United States. Uh, she was born um, in the end uh, 40s and um, uh, she identifies herself as a post-memory generation, so this is uh, the name of this generation, <coughs> which is the second generation, and this post-memory <coughs> term relates to a very specific formation of memory, which develops under very specific circumstances. You cannot generalize it. 
the circumstance is the following. You have a very close situation uh, of two generations in a family, and the parents um, are <coughs> survivors of the Holocaust or another trauma. And the children, <coughs> uh, of course, have nothing to do with that history, but they are in close bodily contact with the parents. And the parents, as survivors and carriers of the trauma, act differently than other parents. In many ways, they are overprotective. I learned uh, a colleague of mine in, in Tel Aviv, she told me her mother never allowed her to learn to swim because she was too anxious, she would drown. But she didn't even think that not learning how to swim would uh, really uh, heighten the possibility mm. to drown. So this is just an uh, example how irrational many things are. And they noticed they were raised differently and they also uh, uh, sensed, of course, uh, the presence of so many dead family members. Also Katya Petrovskaya, uh, she's the third uh, generation post-memory uh, <coughs> example. Uh, she's in a way the carrier of a family memory. Uh, she has very little to do with all these people, but she becomes then, because she ha is, a, is, is um, her body is in a way resonates in a particular way to these stories that she has to do this um <coughs> Um, task to, to recover these stories and to go to these places and to react to these places. So she's the third post generation post memory, and in the case of Marianne Hirsch, uh, there are many, many uh, artists like Art Spiegelmann, Maus, um, hmm. uh, you could also name WG Seewald in, in Germany. These are typical post memory people on the side of the perpetrators and the victims who, uh, in a way, carry this legacy in a very specific way. They are kind of linked between those who are in contact and those who are no longer directly connected. So um, it is a very good question because it brings us back to the sequence of the generation. Yeah, there is a question over there. How many questions have you to answer? Thanks. Uh, I'm very, very, very fluent in English. Uh, I'm very grateful for your uh, lecture about Germany because uh, also, now, uh, notwithstanding, I was born in uh, Ukraine, my ancestors are uh, from Germany. Okay. So, uh, my question is in your opinion, how high is the uh, risk that during the transformation of uh, individual dictatorship uh, into a reliable democracy, we could get uh, no more than a kind of mass uh, dictatorship uh, with its natural need in another mythological chains. I'm not quite sure whether I understood. Just uh, rephrase it. How high is the risk that during transformation of uh, dictatorship <coughs> with indiv individual in the uh, top of this, uh, we could get uh, just another dictatorship with mass on top of this, uh, with its need in uh, another mythological chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it really mm -hmm. worse? Mm -hmm. well, um, I, I just recall the words that you uh, cited from Walter Benjamin, after a failed revolution, what you get... Behind the failed revolution. Failed, uh, yeah. Behind the failed revolution, you should answer, <laughs> is, is um, the counter-revolution. And it is uh, uh, another form of dictatorship that is uh, lurking. Yeah. And um, <coughs> what we what we see right now, of course, uh, in, in Europe, are the leanings towards uh, we're not calling them yet dictatorships. We're calling them illiberal democracies. We have a new term for this because um <coughs> there are many traits of democracy still uh, in place but they are undermined in such a way that uh, they can no longer be, the, the liberties, uh, possibilities cannot longer be used by the citizens. So if you want to start a new newspaper today in, in Hungary, for instance, you can do it. The law allows you to, to uh, start a new newspaper, but you will not get one single <coughs> advertisement there, which of course is the funding of any newspaper because the state will uh, print it. <coughs> Um, so it is the yes but situation. You can do it, but you will not be efficient. You know, it will not work. So this kind of uh, <coughs> um, democracy um, is, is really uh, difficult from our mass dictatorship uh, that we have been familiar with. 
<coughs> because um, uh, <coughs> because it uh, really um, <coughs> uh, destroys uh, one one sector, and that is the sector of art and science. It attacks culture, um, <coughs> and uh, culture becomes the enemy uh, because culture is what is considered suddenly as <coughs> Uh, critical and uh, not supportive of a uh, monologic state. And um, so the, this, I think, is, is a very important sign that something is going wrong when culture and science is be, starts to become regulated, for instance, that, uh, by memory laws and, and things like that. <coughs> and uh, therefore, I think that the Kiev International here uh, is a, a fantastic activity and uh, has, a, has a great uh, continuity also of, of events here to, to show that the arts are alive and that they perform exactly this uh, critical task and that they develop a space for reflection and for um, <coughs> understanding what is the moment uh, of this now, you know, as you put it on your <coughs> poster. Uh, where are we now? Where are we going? And uh, what do we know, have to know about the past um, in order to find the next and the right course. So uh, if we eliminate the arts and, um, and uh, science from helping us to find this path, of course, um, we are in, in dire straits. Yeah, Professor Asman, thank you for the lecture. I have a um, really small uh, clarifying question. Uh, regards your presentation, and um, you uh, talked about this project of the F60s, and I would ask you to uh, outline the uh, temporal frames, maybe some events that, uh, begin, uh, that uh, started and ended this project. And particularly, I would uh, um, uh, like to ask you whether sh we should uh, consider this uh, left wing, uh, uh, this wave of uh, left left wing radical movements uh, um, in Germany, in particularly, and in Europe, as a part of this project, or it is something special, something like, uh, like in development. Part of what? Uh, of 68 uh, projects. Which? So, what is part of what exactly? <laughs> Uh, is uh, radical movements of 70s in Europe? 70s? Uh, uh, of 70s. Ah, okay. Like, like red are... are oh, red yeah, red okay, of course, yeah. Now, I know. Well, of course, uh, they are part of it because they evolved out of it. And as I said, um, <coughs> they developed in very different direction. I always mention the word homogeneous, um, and I said they were not homogeneous, and there were some who went radical in this direction, militant, and they became criminal, and others became politicians. So, you know, you, there was a bifurcation, and some went in this way, and others in that way, and other, others became bourgeois. Uh, so uh, you had all variations, but it was certainly a part of it, and the 70s in... Um, in Germany were a uh, period that's called Bleierner uh, Zeit or um, Herbst, um, what is it? Um, uh, so the, it, it is a, a collective trauma, we can say, col um, connected with the um, 70s, late 70s. And um, that is part of this uh, movement, of course, because it, some of it went in this direction. Earlier. Well, at uh, 60, uh, I already said uh, it's like cutting out, you know, a, a piece and leaving a lot out of it. And um, in, in Germany, 68 is, is really uh, catching only the last bit in a way, um, because most of it started in 67. And I mentioned these two events, uh, Beno Ohnesorg, which was June, and then. Um, <clears throat> that was really, and also Kommune 1 in Berlin, these were uh, things that really got the movement going and they were very <clears throat> iconic events. So it is a little funny why they should be outside of this symbolic number, but as I said, it really doesn't matter. Uh, 
Uh, if you have a number, uh, you have an icon, you have a sign, and then you can attach to the sign emotions, associations, and whatever you like, narratives. And uh, it, this is how memory works. You need a clue, uh, and, and then you know what to uh, target and what to talk about. And it also works as a <coughs> common form of sharing knowledge. You know, if you have such a target date, it, it helps a lot. So it, uh, we have, it, it would be uh, <coughs> uh, not necessary to historicize all of that and uh, set it right. It, it has its function um, and works as this uh, signal date, I would call it, 68, which includes much more than 68. Yeah, there was a question up here at the, in the first row. I don't see the <coughs> Thank you very much, Elena, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I want to, to provoke you a little bit, uh, the connection between the politics of memory on the one side and the what sounded to me as a little bit of a normative distinction between dictatorships and democracies. Um, and let's start with the example of Magna Carta and this uh, wonderful English pride of being a democracy since the 12th century. We know that the powerful democratization and the emergence of liberal democracy and industrialized England was enabled by the other side, by extremely dictatorial uh, English empire over which the sun never set. And uh, this pride of Magna Carta seems to be a little, uh, and, and so this course of democracy and, and European roots of it seems to me to be a, a extremely powerful illusion of memory rather than a, a celebration of a particular version of it. Um, take the United States, uh, where I live, um, uh, you have lots of these forces from high schools to uh, museums about the founding fathers, about the uh, American Revolution, but very little about the slave economy, about the extremely powerful uh, extraction of the uh, human and economic resources uh, which enabled that kind of revolution and as we know there's a lot of alternative history which is not really told, there's no museums, there's no uh, public memorials to that at all, practically all, all over the US. So it's, it's very, uh, I'm, I'm just curious how you make those connections. Uh, thank you so much for this question, it's so important and it's really what um, memory studies is also focusing on now more and more, but because it is um, something that is incipient in these societies themselves. So first of all, uh, Britain. Um, I was really, the Guardian published an article uh, in which um, he told that um, uh, they were very early when it came to abolition. So in the 30s already they had an abolition act and the government had to raise an enormous sum uh, <coughs> Uh, for reparation and uh, it was the highest sum ever raised and now we only learned that the reparation went every penny to the slave owners and not one penny to the slaves themselves. So that was the, the system, you know, the slave owners who were no longer able to own the slaves had to be bailed out, um, bought out and the government paid them so that they would agree <laughs> to have um, the abolition. Um, when it comes to the United States, you're, you're correct. Um, the latest twist in this uh, story is that there is now a um, museum of lynching, uh, which was just um, created. But uh, <coughs> the problem about this new museum is that it is still a private you know, a private um, initiative, it is not yet a legal, a state uh, institution. And uh, this is something that is perhaps now moving forward. Um, there's also another muse uh, slave museum <coughs> uh, in, in process, and, uh, uh, but again, it's a private initiative of two people who got, uh, got together and uh, created a farm land museum uh, in the South. Um, it is something that is really pressing um, and um, you're also right that uh, what I refer to as a self-critical memory culture is not uh, necessarily um, combined with democracies and if these states have a history of uh, 
uh, being victorious in history, you know, it's the victors who write history, as, as Benjamin and others said. So they decide um, they don't have to look back, actually. They are uh, looking forward into the future. And in, in Britain, we can say that uh, the Second World War, World War is less important than the Great War, um, because uh, for the Great War, they were able to uh, imagine themselves as a colonial empire with all the soldiers uh, from all over the world. So they uh, cherish this memory because in this memory they have still have this uh, full colonial imaginaire of this uh, commonwealth um, and even empire. Um, so I can only say yes, uh, what you're saying <laughs> is absolutely um, <coughs> what is the case, but I think perhaps um, things may be moving uh, also in these countries. Yeah, and probably the last question, there is the microphone over there. Thank you very much for the interesting lecture here, and uh, let me please be back to the first question that I asked today. Uh, how do you think um, such things as um, uh, destroying buildings, monuments, renaming streets, uh, influence um, uh, the um, exception of the history and uh, the memories of uh, the next generation? Mm -hmm. Uh, is it necessary to destroy to learn a lesson and where is the line that not, should not be crossed? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we talked about this today because uh, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche has already theorized exactly this situation. He had three models of uh, how to create a memory. One was monumental. You have big heroes whom you adore and take as your models. The second is identitarian. He calls it antiquarian. It's Whatever, you pressure whatever is um, related to where you come from, your place of origin. And the third he calls critical history, and he says this is the moment when uh, society decides to put its own history on the bench of the trial and, uh, uh, and condemns it. And uh, sometimes he says it's important to do this if you have a path that needs to be crossed out, you have to cross it out. And then he says, but there's one problem uh, connected with it, and this is, it is so difficult to find uh, a limit in the process of negation and destruction. He says it's hardly impossible to find this limit. So where do you stop with your negating of your own history? And uh, I think th this is a very important um, <coughs> Uh, insight that um, uh, that can only only be um, solved by historicizing, as I already uh, said in answer to the first question asked by Vazir. Historicizing has to do with uh, <coughs> the possibility of a third way. It's not either it's present or it's absent, but yeah, there could be also a framed present, which is explained and has a, has a, a, a different context. I use as an example the monument parts, you know. The monuments, as so many monuments retired after the fall uh, of um, <coughs> the Soviet Union, after its demise, and they went into monument parks to have, uh, as retired heroes. You know, they are no longer admitted in the center of the city, but in the parks uh, they still are tolerated, uh, which means they are reframed. Uh, they have lost their power to um, <coughs> represent political messages, and they retire there, and then only um, admonitions that they once were part of our history, now we have relegated them, they're no longer in the center, but we have not forgotten them. They had their function during those years, and we know about them, and we can tell the young people who were not uh, present at that time about these stories. So this is all about creating a layered history and knowing about your path in order to be able to work through it, and not just to banish, demolish, and make everything disappear. Yeah, thank you so much.